Financially independent at 30, Wright Thurston's business success was a direct result of his IBM training and experiences. During his sales years with IBM, he achieved national, regional, and state marketing recognition, including six consecutive 100% clubs, regional sales leader, and IBM Salesman of the Year in his area. He applied these proven success strategies to a part-time business and in doing so created a million dollar net worth in less than 18 months. Let's now join Wright as he discusses 60 strategies for successful selling. Hello and welcome. I'm Wright Thurston and in this video program we'll be discussing the topic of 60 strategies for successful selling. Of all the things there are to know, you only need 10% to be successful. I first heard this idea expressed by a terrific IBM instructor by the name of Dave Peoples. While working for the IBM Corporation, I would periodically be sent to either Atlanta or Dallas for training on IBM's products. Much of this training dealt with sales and marketing techniques. Now, After several weeks of intensive training, your mind would be so full of new information that you were mentally exhausted. It was at this point on our last day of instruction that we met Dave Peoples for the first time. Now Dave is a very enthusiastic person and I'll never forget how he stood before us and said, you've been talking and learning about computers and how to sell them, but I think what you really want to hear about is fame, fortune, and glory and how to get it, am I right? And of course he immediately had everyone's complete attention. Dave continued by saying that of all the things there are to know, you only need 10% to be successful. Any more than that becomes a burden. He then shared with us many of the ideas that helped us to get on the IBM fast track, strategies that would accelerate both our careers and our income. It was the type of experience that every salesperson should have at least once a year. I realized that every year we participate in a tremendous amount of learning experiences and yet most of this accumulated knowledge is never used or worse forgotten. If we could only take advantage of just 10 percent of it, just the best ideas and apply them in our lives, wouldn't that make a significant difference in our ultimate success? In this training program, I've outlined 60 strategies that can be applied in any area, especially sales. Ideas that are a constant reminder of the things that we should be doing. Listen to them. Learn them. Practice them and your income will start increasing immediately. The order in which they're listed or their numerical ranking is not important. What is important is that these strategies can be applied in such a way to benefit both you and your customers. Let's begin now our discussion of these 60 strategies. Strategy number one is start at the top. In selling yourself to any organization, be it banks, Fortune 500 companies, people you're dealing with in real estate, remember to call on the highest level possible, the top person, the president of the company. Now you might ask yourself why. Usually they're much easier to see. And once you get in, they're easier to talk to. They can let you know up front if they have any interest because they're the decision makers. The reason they're so helpful is because it's their company. They want your business and they can do things that other people in their organization are not able to do. Successful presidents have learned to treat everyone they come in contact with as a future customer. Even approaching them from a sales capacity does not alter the fact that you could be doing business with them in the future as a customer. Now most people do this from the exact opposite standpoint. Rather than start at the top, they start at the bottom and then try to work their way up. In most companies, there are administrative people whose job it is to protect their superiors. Even if you're successful in getting by them to the next level, you still may be referred to a committee. Look at it this way. If the administrative person you initially encountered could decide and do what the president could, well, these administrative people probably wouldn't be in their current positions. So to double your time effectiveness and your final results, start at the top and call on the head person. Strategies two and three go hand in hand. After starting at the top, now work down using the referral system. As I indicated earlier, it's always desirable to start at the top, but this isn't always possible. Getting an appointment with a company president can be difficult at best. So keep in mind that you're dealing with very busy and important people. They've got so many other commitments and responsibilities. So if you're unable to see them the first day, don't give up. Try to set up an appointment and keep working until you're successful. If you do have a higher contact level, then they can refer you to someone else and you'll have much more credibility. This is so much better than a cold call to an unfamiliar person. 
The ideal situation is when you can telephone or meet them in person and say, Hi, I'm Wright Thurston, and I've been referred to you by a good friend of yours and mine, and they suggested that you'd be able to help me with some questions we have. Could we please take a few minutes? This approach will definitely open doors for you. If your referral comes from this person's peer or someone at a higher level, they're going to give you more consideration than if you were just someone who walked in off the street. There's a story that comes to mind when I think about referrals. The first one concerns Aristotle Onassis. His story has been well documented. In particular, it relates to a time when, as a very young man, Onassis was beginning to compete in the business world. He began working in a country where the normal hourly wage was about 25 cents. He had the idea that he wanted to import and sell tobacco leaves to major companies. By being the middleman, he felt he could make a very handsome profit. So Onassis went to all the various companies in this country, and sure enough, he was rejected and turned down by all of them. Not one to be discouraged, he continued in his efforts. He picked out the company that he wanted to sell to, and then he identified one of the higher level people. And each day he waited outside that company door until that individual was departing for home. Then he followed the person home and he waited patiently outside until the man went to bed. In the morning, Onassis got up early, so he was there when the man came back to work. After two or three weeks of watching Onassis sitting there every day, the man's curiosity reached the point where he could no longer resist from asking, what are you doing? What do you want? And Onassis said, I've tried very hard to talk to your purchasing agent about buying some of my tobacco leaves. And the man replied, oh, is that all? Listen, here's my card. Tell him that I asked you to come in and talk to him. Now, do you think that made a difference? That made all the difference in the world. Now it's just not another person or a vendor coming in, but it's someone that has a referral, and a good referral, from a high-level contact in the business. As a result, Onassis made an initial profit of $500. It was a tremendous amount compared to the average wages that were being paid. And from this humble start, he created a huge financial empire. Anytime you work with others, ask them if they know any other prospects or if they have any other people who might be interested in what you have to offer. They may even be interested themselves. And working with them, if you've done your homework and earned their credibility, you can now make it a win-win situation for all the people involved. You'll not only get referrals, but they'll be good referrals. Strategy number four is what I refer to as Thurston's Third Law. It's just another way of saying, in every worthy pursuit, keep at it at least three times. So often that margin between success and failure is just going ahead and making the extra effort. Think about it for a minute. In baseball, a player gets at least three strikes before they're out. The same applies to boxing. A fight isn't over until you've knocked the other person down at least three times in a round, and even then the battle isn't always over. It simply means you have to prepare for a rematch and the opportunity to fight again another day. For years, I've kept a statement on my desk that says, 20% of the people achieve 80% of the results. The reason for this is these 20% keep making that third, fourth, and fifth attempt until they're successful. Studies have shown that five attempts are usually necessary to get the desired results. Strategy number five is so important, it's always be pleasantly persistent. As I applied for my job with IBM, I was interviewed by several different managers. Ultimately, I reached the offices of the branch manager who made the hiring decisions. We had a very nice conversation. He thanked me for coming in. But I kept thinking to myself, hey, w where's the job offer? Isn't he going to ask me to join his company? And as if he were reading my mind and knew what I was thinking, he told me there were no positions available. But they would keep me in mind, and hopefully I would check back with them in the future. This was not at all what I had expected. After going through this interviewing process for so long, I was psyched up. I wanted to work for this company. And even though I had other offers from excellent organizations, IBM was the one I wanted to work for. So within a day or two, I called and thanked the branch manager over the phone for the time he'd spent with me. Then I followed up that conversation with a letter. Ten days later, I called his secretary to let her know that I was still interested. And would she please contact me when they had an opening? Now there's a very fine line between being pleasantly persistent and being obnoxious. You've got to gauge this for yourself. You must be sincere and you must express a commitment towards what you're trying to achieve to your customers. This process of me calling and keeping myself constantly in front of them went on for about four to six weeks when I received a job offer from one of their major competitors. Now, with this letter in hand, offering me all the various benefits, I marched back into the IBM offices and said to the branch manager, 
I've got an offer here to work for your competitor. The terms, the conditions, the salary, the benefits, everything seems to be the same, except you're the company I want to work for. And I'd like to ask you at this point, are you really interested? Would you give me a position if you had it? Because if you are, I'm willing to wait, even if it takes six months to a year. Shortly thereafter, I was offered a marketing position with IBM. Now, when this job offer was finally mine, I asked the branch manager, why did you finally choose me? What made the difference? And his answer taught me a great deal about being persistent. He said, right, all the people who reach the level where they're interviewed by me are equally qualified to work for IBM. The problem is, we don't have enough positions available. There are so many excellent people in the marketplace, and we can only hire maybe one out of every 10 qualified applicants. The only way we have of judging who will do the best job for us is we watch those people who keep following up, that keep persevering and coming back, not in an obnoxious way, but in a pleasant way. So one of the most important rules of all for salespeople is always be pleasantly persistent. Strategy number six is to make that extra call. Now, this may sound a little bit like Thurston's third law of making that third, fourth, and fifth effort, but there's a twist to it. Once in a year, you'll get a shot at a large transaction, something that can help you achieve your quota for the entire year. In fact, people have said that those once-in-a-lifetime deals can happen as often as every few weeks if you're constantly looking to know what to look for. You've got to be ready for that right moment. You've got to be prepared so you can take advantage of it. So when you're looking for properties or sales leads, when you're making your calls, before you leave your last appointment, always check to see if there's another business either on your right-hand side or your left-hand side. So often we'll be right at the scene of an excellent opportunity and we'll pass it by because we feel like we've already put in our time and that the day's finished. Take an extra few minutes. I've found that it's worth the effort because that extra call will reap you tremendous benefits. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'd like to summarize the first six success strategies that we've talked about. Strategy number one is start at the top. Strategy number two is, after starting at the top, work down throughout the organization. Strategy number three is to use the referral system. Strategy number four is Thurston's third law. Strategy number five is always be pleasantly persistent. Strategy number six is always make that one extra sales call. Strategy number seven is get familiar with your competition. When I say competition, I'm talking about other people who may have the same goals you do. One excellent way of meeting these people is by attending conferences and seminars that are held around the country or in your home state. You'll get the opportunity not only to listen to experts who have had experiences, but more importantly, you'll be able to sit next to people just like yourselves who've been out there trying to accomplish things and to make things happen. When I say get to know your competitors, they shouldn't really be competitors. They might be future partners or people who can help you in achieving the goal that you both share in common. Strategy number eight is use the proper tools. Can you imagine a doctor going into an operating room without the necessary instruments or a tennis player who goes out on the court for the first time and has a tennis racket they've never used before? Make it a point as you travel to keep a briefcase full of the important and necessary items that you'll need. Be sure to carry contracts and forms that are already prepared so that if you do find an interested party, you'll be ready. Carry a business card and a brochure to leave with people. A business calculator and a time management planner are also essential. Be sure to have the proper tools and have them at the time when you need them. Strategy number nine is to qualify your prospects. Qualify the people you're going to be dealing with. Find out right up front in a pleasant way if you should even be talking with these individuals. Why discuss details with a person if that person is unwilling to be flexible? You can waste a tremendous amount of time talking with very nice people who unfortunately are not in a position to work or to deal with you. Since time is money, you can save on both by qualifying your prospects up front. One of the very best ways of qualifying people is strategy number 10. That is, use the phone whenever possible. Of course, people think that any kind of a response to an offer has to be done in person. And of course, there are definite advantages of face-to-face -face contact. But the phone is an excellent way of qualifying someone. Let me say that again. You can qualify someone over the phone. And if after some initial conversation, things appear to be headed in the right direction, then set up an appointment where you can get together and properly pursue the matter. Now, if the idea of talking on the phone bothers you, 
Think of how much more difficult it would be if you were trying to communicate with someone in a foreign language. If you've ever done this, the people you're talking with can be smiling, happy, enthusiastic. You don't know what they're saying because you don't understand their language. So when talking on the phone, you want to present yourself in a professional and knowledgeable manner. Unlike a face-to-face -face situation where body language and personal contact conveys the message, these indicators are missing over the phone. For years, my sales territory in Alaska covered many of the remote areas. It was impossible to get in a car and drive to these areas. In fact, many of these locations didn't have any roads at all. So I found it necessary to spend a lot of time on the phone. And yet, when I made my monthly or bi-monthly visits to these remote locations, the people were ready. It was like they had known me all along because I had kept in contact on the phone. Remember the common courtesies when you're dealing with the phones. Call ahead to confirm an appointment. Occasionally, your customer will have last-minute cancellations. So why drive all the way over to a location to find out that the people aren't even there? And if you're going to be delayed, call and let them know. Your customers will appreciate your professionalism. By letting them know in advance of any delays, you are showing and telling your customers that you value their time and their business. Learn the importance of proper phone skills, and you'll see a significant increase in your business endeavors. Strategy number 11, there are no bad sales territories. In taking over a new territory, have you ever heard the previous salespeople say, there's no potential here. You couldn't sell another machine or another product there if you had to. The area is all sold out. Don't waste your time. Words like that were music to my ears because my experience had shown that if a person felt that way, normally the area and the customers there had been neglected. They hadn't gotten the service and support they deserved. Those were the areas that I called on first. No matter where you live, no matter what kind of environment you have, no matter what the economic situations are, there's a gold mine right in your own backyard. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the story, Acres of Diamonds about a man that searched the whole world only to discover that the fortune was in his backyard. Another famous story is about a man who dug for gold for many years and finally gave up when he was just three feet away from hitting that mother load, that gold that would have set him up for life financially. Don't let people tell you that times are tough or that an area is difficult. Don't let them put you off. If you're competing with someone else, they may purposely want to discourage you. More likely, the people you've been talking to just haven't been using the proper strategies themselves. So timing is the key to this. There are so many different strategies, and it's up to you to pick the one that will work best in your location and your territory under the current conditions. Strategy number 12 is learn to handle rejections and objections. Don't take no for an answer. A no is nothing more than a disguised yes. A friend once told me, right, the people we're dealing with are not our enemies. Ignorance is our enemies. Now, this isn't to say that our customers are ignorant. They just may not be educated or may not be aware of what we're offering. Always remember that a confused mind says no. So find out what your customer's objections are by asking the proper questions. A good qualifying question to use is, if I were to able to meet all the terms and conditions, would you be in a position to sign on the dotted line today? And of course, I would never use the expression sign on the dotted line but see if they're really interested in what you're doing. Now, if they are interested, the answer will be yes. If not, at least you're at the point that you're closer to finding out what their real objections are and why they're not interested in dealing with you. If you're using terms or other expressions that are unfamiliar to them, this can also cause confusion. But don't despair. Just keep at it, stay calm, and keep asking the right questions. You'll be amazed at how often you can turn that no response into a yes order. At this point, I'd like to summarize the second six success strategies that we've just covered. Strategy number seven is get familiar with your competition. Strategy eight, use the proper tools. Number nine, qualify your prospects. Number 10, use the phone whenever possible. Number 11, there are no bad sales territories. And number 12, learn to handle rejections and objections. Strategy number 13, don't recreate the wheel. Someone has once said, don't invent, don't develop, don't pioneer, don't discover. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be creative. You should try and enhance other ideas that exist. What I'm saying is that a lot of good people spend all of their time trying to find unique approaches for increasing their earnings. They spend hours and hours looking for strategies that are already there. 
not only will they usually fail to find that strategy, but they won't even get a letter of commendation for their efforts. Don't waste your precious time. Never recreate or write something that may already be written for you. Learn from the experiences of others. Number 14, appoint yourself a consultant. They say that a teacher learns more than his students because the teacher spends so much time in preparing. I like to tackle each new job and assignment as if I was going to be consulting someone else about what I was studying. By doing this, I'll know I'll have to have more than a casual knowledge. I'll have to know it more than if I was just cramming for an exam and could forget about it the next day. I'd want to learn and study it so that when I conveyed these materials to someone else, it would be clear and they would want to come back for further advice. Strategy number 15 is share the wealth. I'm reminded of a man who woke up one morning and realized that the end of the rainbow was in his backyard. Naturally, at the end of this rainbow was this pot of gold we've heard so much about. Excitedly, he dashed outside, quickly filling his pockets and his wheelbarrow with as much of this gold as he could. He soon realized that the rainbow would be gone and with it this great fortune. Now, this individual was a good person. He wasn't greedy. Sure, he wanted his fair share, but he also wanted to share his good fortune with others. So he immediately started calling his closest friends, offering to share his newfound wealth with them. All they had to do was come over as quickly as they could and get involved. I think this story illustrates quite well the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Share your successes with your close friends. If you feel they're perceiving it incorrectly or if they don't seem to have an interest, then back off. Approach them again at another time. However, if you're close to them and if they know the true intent of your heart, then they'll realize that you're trying to share something with them that's good and that will be good for them. Strategy number 16 is the old Boy Scout motto, be prepared, and it's as true today as it was in the past. Before making your sales presentations or anything else that's related to your business, make sure you're prepared, do your homework, and do the legwork that's required. I saw a training film years ago entitled, Pack Your Own Chute, meaning pack your own parachute, and it made a very good point. If you're going to be in an airplane and suddenly jump out thousands of feet above the earth, do you really want to be jumping out with a parachute that you haven't checked out personally? Do you want to let someone else have the responsibility for the safety of your life? Or do you want to pack your own chute so when the time comes you're ready? Think about this. Strategy number 17 is practice what you preach. Now at the same time it's nice to share your successes with the whole world. Don't do it with your sales manager or anyone else until you've actually accomplished it. Years ago I had an opportunity to sell a tremendous amount of IBM copiers to a major university. And the copier representative working with me got so excited about the potential sale that he told everyone that we would be putting in probably two or three times the amount of machines that actually happened. And rather than this be a very positive experience, it became a very negative experience because he had talked about things before he had done it. How many people have talked about, for, uh, about fortunes that they could have had if they only would have done this or that? The world is full of people with hindsight. Just make sure you've done what you're talking about. People, especially your customers, are very perceptive. They'll know if you're doing a snow job on them. They'll know if you know what you're talking about. So practice what you preach. Success strategy 18 adds on to number 17. Practice makes perfect. Ted Williams, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, once remarked that he got tired of people saying he was a natural hitter that he had terrific instincts and that he never needed to practice. Williams said that nothing could be farther from the truth. As a young boy, he spent hours and hours swinging a baseball bat, perfecting his motion, and doing the things that made it seem so easy to the rest of us. I'm reminded of the story of Gary Player, the great South African golfer, when someone came up and told him how effortless he made golf seem. And Gary Player said to them, I wish you could be with me while I hit those thousands of golf balls as I practiced into the wee hours of the morning, as my hands became caked with blood from the effort. People will sometimes come up to you and tell you that you may have a gift for this or that, but obviously you've developed your gifts and talents through preparation and by getting ready. The more you practice, the better you become. Let's now summarize the last six strategies that we've just discussed. Strategy number 13, don't recreate the wheel. Number 14, appoint yourself a consultant. Strategy 15, share the wealth. Success strategy number 16, be prepared. Number 17, preach what you practice. 
And finally, success strategy number 18, learn by doing. In other words, practice makes perfect. Success strategy 19, learn and practice the KISS technique. The initials in the word KISS, K-I-S-S, -S, stand for keep it short and simple. More than one great sales effort has fallen through the cracks because someone in an effort to be friendly became so talkative that they gave information that confused their customer, and that killed the transaction. Always be completely honest and upfront. Just don't volunteer anything more than what they're asking for. Answer their questions, but don't volunteer unnecessary information. Also, don't use big phrases or words that are unfamiliar. Your prospects may close their minds and their wallets and back off if you start using technical terms or strange sounding words. Especially if they perceive that you're using a canned or memorized sales pitch, this makes them feel unimportant. People like to feel like they're dealing with people like themselves. So when they hear words they don't know, it frightens them. So keep it as simple and as short as possible. Strategy number 20, get your feet wet. Why learn to swim if you never get in the water? Take the knowledge you're learning about and reading about and then go out and do it. I've had good friends that have read and studied everything on sales, but it took them years before they started applying this information. You've got to ask the right questions. You're never going to get a yes or a no for that matter without opening your mouth. You must act and apply the knowledge you've learned. Strategy 21, surround yourself with the very best. So many people think that they have to go out and do it all by themselves. It's important that you don't try to be a one man or a one woman effort. There are so many people with tremendous experiences and abilities that will be more than happy to work with you on your team. They want to share and help you climb that ladder of success. You just need to know how to approach them and how to work with them. It's been said that the best are free because they save you more than what they cost. This refers to people who are on your success team, the people whose efforts and knowledge you're able to combine with your own knowledge. By working with other experts, you actually can create a formula that goes like this. One plus one equals three. You take what you know, you combine it with what they know, and you actually end up with a product that's greater than the sum of the other two. We've all had special experiences that give us a better appreciation of a given situation. You'll be surprised how your ideas, coupled with the ideas of others, can multiply and give you new insights you've never had before. Strategy number 22, remember the law of averages. Many new salespeople get discouraged initially because they're not getting the orders and having the success. It may take you many calls, dozens of calls, before you write your first order. Always keep this thought in mind. If it took you 50 sales presentations or 50 sales calls to get one transaction, that earned you $5,000, each one of those 50 contacts or presentations would be worth $100. So in the future, every time someone tells you no or they're not interested or come back later, you can say to yourself, all right, I just made another $100. And by taking that positive approach and using the law of averages, you'll be much more successful. Strategy 23, be your own boss. In the presentations I give around the country, I like to ask my audiences to raise their hand and to repeat after me, from this day on, I am my own boss. I've learned that people, especially in sales, if they will think of themselves as the president of their own companies, if they will act as if they are working for themselves rather than for someone else, they'll have much more success. In the future, pretend, even if you're working with another organization, that someday you will be the president of that company. Pretend that you own 51% of the stock. I don't want you to have this wage slave mentality, and I don't want you to think of yourself as a, an employee for anyone else. Over 90% of the battle is realizing that you're in control of your territory, and it's all up to you. Strategy number 24, always use a checklist. Keep a handy, ready reference list of power phrases and other terms you'll want to use in your contracts and sales presentations. Keep a to-do list as part of this checklist. Each evening, I write down between 10 and 15 items that I want to accomplish during the next day. Then I prioritize them using the letters A, B, and C. I put down A's next to the most important items. C's are for my lowest priority items. Your C items will probably be the easiest to accomplish, but resist the temptation and concentrate your energies on your A priorities. There are many excellent books on the various aspects of time management. I would encourage you to set up a system of checklists and to-do lists to remind you of the important things you want to do and accomplish. 
Now let's go ahead and review the past six strategies that we've just covered. Strategy 19, learn and practice the KISS method. Strategy 20, get your feet wet. Strategy 21, surround yourself with the very best. Strategy 22, remember the law of averages. Strategy number 23, be your own boss. And strategy 24, always use a checklist. Number 25, review your successes and your failures. You can learn a lot from your mistakes as well as your successes. So when you've completed a transaction or a sales call, make a note in your journal. Make that entry about what you did well and what you'd like to improve on the next time and what you'll definitely want to avoid in the future. If you ever get involved in a sales selling slump, it's a good idea to go back and review past successes to see the things that have been positive, to encourage you to move you forward where you're having the sales success again. Strategy number 26, get involved. Be a contributor. There are so many excellent organizations that can help you on your road to success. They need your participation as much as you need them. Groups that come to mind such as United Way, Chamber of Commerce, and men's and women's organizations. They're found in most major cities in the United States. You'll find there are tremendous benefits as a result of getting involved and helping your community to grow and prosper. I grew up in a military family, and we would be transferred to a new location every two to three years. My parents taught us that no matter where we lived, we should always get involved. Give as much as you can to your community to make it a better place to live, they used to say. As you serve and contribute, you'll start to see amazing results. You'll get excellent business contacts and referrals. It's always better to give than to receive. You'll find that by sowing good works and getting involved, you'll reap the benefits from helping others. As I got involved in various civic, church, and community activities, I got to know other leaders in that community. That certainly made it easier when I had to sit down across the desk from them later on in a sales capacity. So be of service to others and contribute to your community. Strategy 27, never start with the ABCs. If you've ever had a list and it goes from A to Z, keep in mind that probably everyone else has either started at the beginning with the A's or at the ending with the Z's. Then by the time they've reached the middle, which is the J's or K's, they're tired. So they stop their work and they forget to continue it later on. I like to start in the middle. It's usually the middle or the second half of the list that never gets called. In these neglected areas, you can find some of your best opportunities. Strategy 28, be generous in your praise. When you work with people, it never hurts to be thankful, to give praise and to acknowledge the contributions of others. On the other hand, if you feel you've been inadvertently offended, take the proper steps to correct any bruised feelings. When someone goes out of their way and puts forth that extra effort, do more than just acknowledge it in your mind. Take time to write a short note, or better yet, why not send them a small gift? It doesn't have to be anything expensive or large, just something that says, I appreciate you. I appreciate your making my job a little easier. If you'll do this, people will remember you, and when you come to work with them again, they'll give you that extra consideration. This next suggestion or strategy, number 29, deals with what I refer to as the peace of mind strategy. It involves protecting your assets. As sales and marketing people, we work hard to provide for our families and loved ones. Too often, some people are not prepared for the unforeseen and unexpected tragedies. If you've ever known someone that's had a tragic death in their family, it's devastating enough without some of the proper documents being in order. Why see your whole life's work go up in smoke or be given away to the government and taxes just because you failed to plan properly. So make a note right now. Sit down and get together the proper documentation. Put it somewhere where your spouse will have access to it. Tell a close friend or the family attorney where it is. Then if something happens, you've covered yourself. It's surprising how many people have never sat down and made a will or don't have the proper insurance. These documents are so important for the safety and security of your family and loved ones. I promise you that your ability to sell effectively will increase, as will your income, when you have taken the necessary steps to protect your assets. Strategy number 30 is to always ask questions. Ask for help. Don't be afraid to open your mouth. If you come to seminars and presentations, seek the experts. Ask the questions. Don't think your questions aren't as important as someone else's. Sure they are. How else are you going to learn? How are you ever going to get ahead unless you ask questions? Reading from books and magazines and listening to tapes is terrific, but there's no substitute for having the actual person there in front of you. So if you run into someone who can help you, don't be afraid to talk to them. 
I'll always be thankful to the many experts who were kind enough to listen to my questions. Maybe in their minds my questions were simple and basic, but they weren't to me at that stage of my development. And once you reach a certain level of expertise, you should try to help the newer and less experienced people you deal with. Let's summarize the six strategies we've just covered. Strategy 25, review your successes and your failures. 26, get involved, be a contributor. Strategy 27, never start with the ABCs. 28, be generous in your praise. 29, protect your assets. And finally, number 30, ask questions and ask them often. Strategy 31, be a people person. In sales, they say there are people persons and number persons. Too often in our society, individuals are viewed only as numbers or statistics. It seems that emphasis is placed more on accomplishing a required goal or quota than actually helping the individual or customer. As a people-oriented salesperson, you should always strive to elevate other people with you. As you climb the ladder of success, as you reach out to be number one, don't ever step on numbers two through ten. Again, elevate them with you. Let them share in your successes. As you do this, when you reach that higher level, your friends and associates will rally around you. They will support you and help keep you in your current position. Success strategy 32 is strive to make things happen. Too many salespeople sit around wasting time, missing out on income opportunities. Resolve today to be a person who makes things happen. Associate with groups or people who are motivated in doing things. If you find yourself being bogged down with some of the wrong people, the negative thinkers, that's all right. Many of your friends may not have the same right stuff you're looking for. I'm not saying don't keep your current friendships, but seek out new relationships. Seek out other sources so you can be aware of upcoming opportunities. As I stated earlier, strive to be around people who are goers, that are motivators, and that are doing things. Strategy 33 is become a tax expert. There are so many tax changes occurring constantly that have a long-lasting effect on you and your income. You need to be aware of all of these changes. You need to make the appropriate strategies to minimize the amount of taxes that you'll be paying back to your Uncle Sam. I realized just after a few years of working for IBM that so much of every dollar I was earning seemed to be going to the government and that I wanted to keep more of it for myself and my family. I felt like I knew best what I could do with my money and I wanted more control over it. So I made an effort to subscribe to various tax publications. I read up on them, and I sought out the advice of a competent CPA, a certified public accountant. After working at becoming a tax expert for two to three years, my accountant paid me what I thought was one of the nicest business compliments I've ever had. He said, right, of all the clients I have, you're the most informed from a tax standpoint. Just by concentrating on this area, I've been able to save tens of thousands of dollars in taxes. An ex-Supreme Court Justice, Learned Hand, said that none of us are under any obligation to pay any more taxes than is absolutely necessary. I'm not saying to avoid the taxes, but take advantage of the current tax laws. Get back some of your hard-earned sales dollars so that you can reinvest them. By doing this, you can build up a retirement nest egg for yourself and your family. Strategy 34 is the importance of being observant. I mentioned earlier about interviewing for my position with IBM. Prior to reaching the branch manager's office, I was interviewed by two other managers. One manager had many items in his office that related to Hawaii, and upon mentioning this to him, I realized that he was going to be getting married shortly, and he was taking his honeymoon to Hawaii. Having lived there for many years, we talked about this, and I gave him suggestions on where to go and what to do. In the office of the next manager was a picture of this particular individual standing in front of a very famous historical monument in Italy. I had lived in Italy for two years when my father was in the military, so again, I was able to talk to him about something that had been a special experience to him. I'm reminded about the office of a banker colleague. He had caught the second largest fish ever in a particular category, and he was very proud of this, and there was a large picture on his wall. By mentioning it every time I went into his office, this pleased him, and it helped our conversations and dealings to go much smoother. Strategy 35 is to keep the proper publications. Keep yourself current and keep yourself motivated by continually renewing and recharging your batteries. Subscribe to several monthly or weekly publications that contain new and exciting ideas that relate to your job. One newsletter that will help you become a tax expert is the Kiplinger Tax Letter. 
There are also four sales-related publications that I can recommend. Two are issued by the Dartnell Corporation of Chicago. They are entitled Salesmanship and Successful Closing Techniques. Both are excellent. Another publication, Master Salesmanship, is distributed by Clement Communications. Many of you will also enjoy reading Personal Selling Power, published out of Virginia. These publications will help you to see important marketing techniques from a different perspective. Strategy 36. Don't do your paperwork in the heat of battle. Marketing people often use prime time selling hours to do things which are important, but really could be done better at another time. Whenever possible, business paperwork such as proposals, contracts, correspondence should be handled before or after work. In the evening, if you're going to watch TV, for example, a sporting event, take your paperwork in with you. Even if that great moment happens where the touchdown is scored or the home run is hit, don't worry about missing it. I'm sure that you'll see it over and over again on instant replay or at the 6 or 11 o'clock news. Schedule particular times of the day to do your bills, letters, and correspondence so that it doesn't detract from those prime business hours when you should be out looking and working and providing a steady income for your family. Let's take a moment now to review the six strategies that we've just covered. Strategy 31, be a people person. Number 32, strive to make things happen. Strategy 33, become a tax expert. Number 34, is the importance of being observant. Number 35, get the proper publications. And strategy 36, don't do your paperwork in the heat of battle. Strategy 37, keep a library at home. As you start getting publications that relate to your field of work, as you invest in career building books, you'll want to have these references handy. You'll want to build up the kind of support materials that will help you to be successful. Initially, you're not going to be able to afford everything you want, and that's why it's a good idea to join or form a networking group. Then you'll be able to share and trade experiences with other members and share and trade their materials. I don't know how many times I've prepared or given a sales presentation only to discover there was something in my home library or in my files that showed me a better way of handling the same transaction. We all sell to different entities. You sell to state and local governments differently than you do to organizations in the private sector. You've probably already got most of the items at your fingertips, but if you don't have them in a format that is readily accessible, you might miss out on some important information as indicated. By not having your reference materials at home, you may be losing potential income unnecessarily. Strategy 38. Conduct your presentations in a conversational manner. This is so important for salespeople. If you're not at ease, your customers won't be at ease. And this is the golden rule of selling. You relax so that your customers can relax. The way you can help them to relax the most is by speaking to them in a normal, conversational manner. If you're uneasy about your speaking skills, get involved with an organization such as Toastmasters. Volunteer to give presentations at your companies. Give presentations at your church and in community organizations. And by doing this, you'll speak better on your feet and your sales will increase. Strategy 39. Always be willing to say, I don't know. Customers are going to ask you questions that you don't know the response to. I've found that by ad-libbing or pretending to know something that you don't, you lose credibility. If you can tell them right up front, I don't know, but I'll be more than happy to check this out and get back to you with an answer, this gives you so much credibility and shows the customer that you're a complete professional. I've had people who've asked me questions for several hours on my subject tell me afterwards that when I said I didn't know the answer but that I would look it up, this made them feel like I was a normal person. So please, if you don't know the answer to something, don't fake it. Just be upfront and honest and say, I don't know. Strategy number 40 is, if in doubt, charge straight ahead. Now I'm not talking about being reckless and about not doing anything without any prior thought, but there are times when, what have you got to lose? If you charge ahead with good intentions, if you do make a mistake, the easiest thing in the world to say is, I'm sorry, I'm new at this, I apologize, and if I'm not doing it correctly, I'd really like to know how to do it correctly. You'll find that people are more than happy to help you if you approach them with a humble and an interested attitude rather than a cocky and a, I already know it all so you can't help me attitude. Again, knowledge is only helpful if you act on it. Be decisive, charge straight ahead. It takes guts to get out there and do it, so don't sit back, don't be an armchair quarterback, how does the saying go, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission? Showing initiative pays off in the long run, so get involved in the action. Strategy 41, plan ahead. 
I have a plaque that my wife knitted for me in my office that says, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Don't wait for the rainy days. Get prepared now. So when the times are right, you'll be ready. Think what would have happened if Noah had procrastinated. Learn to act, not react. Be in control of your situation. Don't let others control you. Be the master of your environment. Too often, people manage on a crisis level. They go from one crisis to another because they never anticipate. And they always seem to feel like the situation is controlling them. You can reverse that just by changing your philosophy on management. Make contingency plans so that you'll know what to do in the event of an emergency. This is the kind of information you can convey to your family. They'll also know how you'd like them to act if something comes up unexpected. Another favorite saying of mine is, he that fans fails to plan, plans to fail. It's amazing how people want to start out on the road of su success, but don't have a proper road map. You need to put plans in proper perspective. Make a logical outline in such a way that you can be most effective. Strategy 42, learn to cope with stress. A noted authority once said, number one, don't sweat the small stuff. And number two, it's all small stuff. If you can't flee, then flow. Don't worry about things that you don't have any control over or can't change. People waste time worrying about things that have happened in the past. The best solution to past mistakes is to resolve to never make the same mistakes again. To approach each day with a new attitude or new perspective. To say, okay, there's stress in my work. I can deal with it. Even being a little more realistic can help tremendously. Get into better habits. Get the proper rest. Eat properly. Take time for rest and relaxation. All of these areas will help release the tension that builds up over a period of time. Let's take a moment now and review these strategies that we've just covered. Strategy 37, keep a library at home. Strategy 38, learn to conduct yourself in a conversational manner. Number 39, always be willing to say, I don't know. Strategy 40, if in doubt, charge straight ahead. 41, learn to plan ahead. And 42, learn to cope with stress. Strategy 43 is use Lombardi time. Vince Lombardi was the great football coach for the Green Bay Packers. He taught his players and staff to always be 15 minutes early to every transaction. If you were five minutes early, you were really 10 minutes late. Now Vince may have been carrying this to an extreme, but having grown up in a military family where punctuality was very important, I've learned that one of the rudest things you can do is to keep other people waiting. It's like saying to them, my time is better than yours and more important. It's okay if you sit around. You should always try and arrive ahead of schedule. In fact, I like to set my watch five minutes ahead of time, so if I do get delayed, I've got that extra cushion of time. One of the most important things a salesperson can do is to create a good impression. People who are habitually late or who fail to make appointments on time begin with a strike against them. Strategy 44 is the word think. Just one simple word. In fact, IBM feels so strongly about this word that they've written it up in nine or ten different languages. They've passed out plaques to employees that remind them to think before they do something. So often that will make the added difference. I'm reminded of a story of the executive who in the traditional three-piece suit is showing a colleague from another company around their facilities. Of course, they're going through the offices where everyone is neatly dressed. Then they get to one room and there's a man with his feet on the desk. He's got a beard, uncombed hair, wearing Levi's and tennis shoes. He's not asleep, but it looks like he's daydreaming. And the one executive said, well, what does this person do? And the response was, he's paid to think. Well, what does he think about? Well, he thinks up slogans and new ideas, and he's paid very well. And some six-figure salary was mentioned. And the other executive said in surprise and amazement, well, what could he think about that's so significant? And the reply was, have you ever noticed on products the words new and improved? Or have you heard the hamburger commercial that says, where's the beef? One person has probably sat around thinking up catchy phrases to help you sell your sales products. I hope you can relate that story to the importance of always analyzing and looking at everything you have. Often it's just the last minute review or last minute reevaluation that will help you to change something that will make you more effective in your presentation. Strategy 45, pay attention to details. Joel Weldon, in his presentation, Elephants Don't Bite, began by asking the audience, how many of you people have ever been bitten by a mosquito? And of course, most of the hands went up. 
Then he asked, how many of you have ever been bitten by an elephant? And everybody laughed because no one's hand went up. And unless you've really had some interesting experiences in life, you haven't been bitten by an elephant. And the point Joel was making was, it's not the big things that get you, it's the little things. I'm reminded of a story concerning J.P. Getty, who was one of the richest men in the world. He evidently was inspecting one of his oil drilling rigs, and he felt that the operation was being mismanaged and that his people were not paying attention to detail. So Getty instructed the payroll department to purposely withhold a very small amount, like $5, from the paychecks of several executives in charge of things. As Getty suspected, within a few minutes of receiving their paychecks, these executives approached the payroll department wanting to know where their $5 was. So they were aware of the difference when it affected them, even on a minor amount like $5. And yet their inattentiveness and their lack of follow through on detail was costing Getty a tremendous amount of money. Needless to say, others were promoted to fill their vacated positions. So pay attention to the details, both large and small. Strategy 46 is be a good listener. As the minister once said, we have two ears and only one mouth, so we should spend at least twice as, twice as much time listening as we do talking. Everyone likes to talk and enjoys sharing stories with others, but remember to extend, extend the same courtesy to others. You'll get a lot more mileage by asking people questions about themselves and letting them talk, rather than by you telling them how great you are by sharing your own experiences. So be a good listener. Strategy 47 is follow up and do it consistently. Although similar to a previous strategy, this rule makes another key selling point. When making sales calls, your customers might indicate that the timing is not right for them at that moment. Maybe they're at the end of a fiscal year and out of funds. And they end their comments by saying, why don't you contact us again three to six months from now? Now this may only be a ploy to get rid of you, an attempt to make you feel that they might be interested in the future. For this very reason, I started keeping a tickler file labeled for the upcoming 12 months of the year. Let's say that I made the initial sales call in January. As a result of the meeting, I make a note to myself on the April calendar to follow up with this company. And friends, the results are amazing. When I call back and say, Mr. Smith, when we met last January, you said that the timing would be better for you in April. Could we please schedule an appointment to continue our discussion? There have been some exciting new developments since we last spoke. Follow-up is so important, and it will put extra dollars in your pocket. Strategy 48, find out what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. Just as the salmon swim upstream against the current to get to the best areas, often we can succeed faster by taking the path less traveled. By making our own path, others will want to follow us. When people are having difficulties in their personal lives or business situation, sometimes they become like the ostrich. They bury their heads in the sand and hope the problems will go away, when in fact they should be doing the exact opposite. They should be confronting the problem head on, looking at all of the possibilities and ramifications, saying, I like challenges. It's much more fun to win a hard fight than an easy one. So see what the crowd is doing. Then take a look at the opposite point of view. I think you'll find the opportunities to be very significant. Let's stop now and summarize what we've just covered. Strategy 43 is use Lombardi time. 44 is the word think. Strategy 45, pay attention to details. 46, be a good listener. Strategy 47 is to follow up and do it consistently. And strategy 48, find out what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. Success strategy 49 is the phrase, you may be right. What this particular strategy is all about is the importance of never arguing or getting into verbal conflicts with the people you come in contact with. You'll meet many people who might have off-the-wall ideas. Rather than confronting them, this particular phrase, you may be right, is a polite, neutral way of acknowledging someone's feelings without saying one way or the other whether you agree or disagree with them. Many of us feel the need sometimes to express our feelings. We feel that we're not being honest and upfront unless we tell everyone exactly how we feel. In business, it's important to be tactful and to learn not to alienate someone, especially if they happen to be having a bad day. So by using the phrase, you may be right, the customer's anger will be dissipated and diffused, and you'll get a lot more accomplished. Strategy 50 is you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. This is so true, not only in ourselves, but in our business dealings. 
People do form opinions about us based on our first meetings. There are many excellent books on dressing for success and how to appear your very best. The point we should remember is, how do others perceive us? What goes through their mind? What are we aware of? How can we change that in ourselves? Clothes won't guarantee success, but they'll certainly give you a head start, a jump on the rest of the competition. I worked in a remote northern Alaskan community where I was about the only person in town that wore a suit. And I felt a little out of place wearing a suit and tie. But by the same token, it seemed to give me an added credibility. People had more respect, even though they didn't know me, because I appeared dressed as an authority figure. So dressing nicely can have multiple benefits for you. Strategy 51 is the law of 250. For years, Joe Girard had the distinction of having sold the most cars of any salesperson in the United States. In fact, he's listed in the Guinness Book of World Records. In his own book, he states that everyone you come in contact with, if you treat them properly and make it a win-win situation, will respond by sharing their good fortune and their news with their friends. If, on the other hand, you really twist their arm and make them do something they don't want to do, they'll also pass along that information as well. It's a geometrical progression. One person tells two or three people, and they each tell two or three people. Gerard made the statement that it actually has the effect of getting the news out positively to 250 people or negatively 250 people. Keep this idea in mind next time you're tempted to argue with a customer. Strategy 52 is the very basic and universal concept of smiling. Much has been written on this in the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and the book discusses the therapeutic and beneficial effects of you smiling at someone else. The main point made is that people may start the day happy and in a good mood, yet as the day progresses, they just get worn out. Sometimes when people need a smile most is when they've run out of smiles themselves. I found in dealing with clients, many of them don't have happy dispositions. Maybe it's the pressures of their jobs and they're bogged down. By continually smiling over time, people realize that my happiness was genuine and sincere. I noticed a positive change in the way they responded and acted when we were together. They say it takes more muscles in your face to frown than it does to smile, so conserve a little energy. Be happy and smile. Strategy 53 is leave something with everyone. A good salesperson, even if they don't get the order, will try to leave a brochure, a business card, or send a follow-up letter. Something that is in front of the customer that will remind the customer of the sales call. By the same token, Many real estate investors will send to a specific area a letter letting property owners know that they're interested in their buildings. For future dealings, always get your customer's name and address and leave yours there also so you can always get together in the future. Don't miss out on this golden opportunity. Leave something with everyone you come in contact with. Strategy 54, become an expert in something. It's been said that if you will dedicate an hour a day towards a particular field of study that you can become an expert in that subject within five years. Think of this. Do you want to become a master salesperson? Would you like to become a master closer? If you're willing to simply commit 60 minutes a day by reading, studying, and practicing the techniques that you learn about, within five years you can be a nationally recognized expert. You can choose any field that you want, but just decide now to dedicate this 60 minutes a day. Let's go ahead and take a moment now to discuss the six areas we've just covered. Strategy 49 is the phrase, you may be right. Strategy 50, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. 51 is the law of 250. Strategy 52 is the concept of smiling. Strategy 53 is leave something with everyone. And strategy 54, become an expert in something. Success strategy 55, sell on your own merits. You don't build yourself up by knocking others down. In fact, it was grounds for dismissal at IBM if you were found to be disparaging or bad-mouthing the competition. If someone brought up another vendor, it was best either to ignore it or to make a complimentary comment such as, yes, they are a very fine organization, but we feel we have excellent products as well. You'll find that people will test you on this. Saying something negative about your competition only reflects poorly on you. If you'll stick to selling your own products, selling on your own merits, people will realize that you're not someone that wants to get ahead by disparaging others. Strategy 56, there is strength in proper positioning. For those of you that follow sports, 
it's important in basketball to position yourself under the basket so that when someone takes a shot and it doesn't go in, you can get the rebound. In racquetball, you're supposed to try to gain control of the middle section of the court. So no matter what shot is taken, you can simply take a step to the right or to the left or reach up and you'll be able to anticipate and return any shot. It's important to be in control, to position yourself properly. Along with this comes the importance of timing. There is a right time and a wrong time for everything. If we're over anxious, we may do something that would have been much better to do later at a later time. Strategy 57. Be the best in everything you do. A group study was done over the years to determine what percentage of the participants would become financially independent. It was determined from this study that those people who achieved their financial goals were the people who became very involved in their work situation, no matter what it was. Even if they were unhappy with their job, they persevered, they hung in there, they learned as much as they could, they took all their knowledge, experiences, and applied them later on to different areas. By successfully applying their experiences, they reaped tremendous dividends. They were, in effect, investing in themselves. They patiently waited for the time when they could break into a different field and make their fortune. The people who became financially independent strived to be the very best in what they were doing. Because they were good, people recognized that, and they were given more opportunity to advance and to learn. Strategy 58 is the secret of life. I read that the secret of life, at least in the terms of a salesperson's life, is to find out what other people want and then find a way that you can provide it for them. That seems quite simple, doesn't it? And yet too often, salespeople will try to sell you solutions to problems that you don't have. If they would only take the time to apply the other strategies we've talked about, by asking the proper questions, being a good listener, trying to find out what the problem was and then overcoming the objection, they would be much more successful in helping people satisfy their needs. So think. How can I help this person achieve their objectives? If you can do that, you'll find that many of your own goals can be achieved and both of you can win at the same time. Strategy 59 is the importance of remembering names. There's nothing sweeter to anyone than the sound of their own name. It takes practice when you're first introduced to someone to remember their name. There are many name association tricks and little repetitive things that you can do to improve your memory. Don't you feel better when someone you're talking with refers to you by name? It makes you feel special. It makes you feel as if the people are genuinely and sincerely interested in you. Some will say, well, right, I don't have a memory for names. But friends, this is something that can be cultivated with practice. So go to the library. Check out one of the books written on this subject. You can learn to remember names and to associate them with people. If you do this, when you see these people outside of work situations with your family, you won't be tongue-tied. You'll be able to go up and introduce your wife, children, friends, or whomever you're with. Then these people will know that you have an interest in them that goes beyond their office or work environment. Finally, strategy number 60 is endure to the end. Too many people, after they've had a hard struggle, give up. Winston Churchill once said to a group of young students, never, 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 never give up. Winston Churchill had a tremendous amount of self-control. It's the kind of self-control that we should try to develop and maintain in ourselves. A friend of mine asked his daughter who her favorite cartoon character was. One of the Saturday morning programs she enjoyed was the Roadrunner cartoon with the little bird that goes around going beep beep. There's also Coyote that's always trying to drop a rock on this bird or run it over with a truck or blow it up with some dynamite so that he can capture it, cook it, and eat it. Well, this little girl said to her father, Daddy, my favorite cartoon character is the coyote. And the father was shocked. He thought, well, why is my sweet daughter identifying with this mean, nasty coyote? And her remark was very revealing. She said, Daddy, I like the coyote because he never gives up. No matter what happens, the trucks can roll over him, the dynamite can explode in his face, he can fall in his own trap, but he knows what he wants to do and he keeps doing it. I like that. Let's take a moment now and summarize these final six strategies we've just covered. Strategy 55, sell on your own merits. 56, there is strength in proper positioning. Strategy 57, be the best in everything you do. 58, is the secret of life. Strategy 59 is the importance of remembering names. 
And finally, Success Strategy 60 is Endure to the End. Ladies and gentlemen, as a final note, it's important in everything you do to be enthusiastic. Be excited. Get fired up. It's so important that we believe in ourselves and in our abilities. What's the famous saying? Anything the mind can conceive and believe, you can achieve. That's a true statement. In fact, as we review these 60 strategies, how many of them are we currently using on a daily basis? Decide right now to concentrate on just 10% of these 60 principles. Take six of the techniques and start applying them to your own marketing environment. You'll see greater returns and increased earnings. As you can see, there are many strategies that we have not touched on that you may have used in your own situation. And I'd like to be aware of these. So please take the time and write and share these strategies with me. You'll find the address on the bottom of this video cassette, and I'll gladly send you a thank you gift if you'll share something with me that I can use in the future. Again, don't give up. Continue until you reach your financial goals. This is Wright Thurston. Goodbye and good luck.